Thank you very much, Ben, and good evening. And thank you for that introduction. I've never been commended to an audience before on the grounds that I'm not an estate agent, not a surveyor, and not a male. Um, but hey, why not? Um, the great thing about being in Savills is that I do get to uh, see what's happening when it comes to value and money. And I guess, ultimately, that's what I'm talking about. And what I want to put across tonight is something about what we've learnt about urbanism and its value, and then look at why it's so seldom done, um, or done properly, and put forward some, uh, if you like, solutions. I will be bringing in uh, some examples of uh, world cities that, that we've looked at. Um, I, do, I, I do have a picture from outer space, uh, which I haven't put in my, um, uh, my uh, talk tonight, uh, but it's probably most useful if you're, uh, it's a picture of Earth and the Moon from Saturn, and it's very shiny but very, very small, and I guess if you've just been dealing with Islington planners, that might put things into perspective for you. So if anyone wants it, I'll happily email it. But um, that, that's as near as I get to outer space. I guess if I'm talking about urbanism and whether it pays, I ought to first of all define what I mean by urbanism and uh, what we've been, been looking at. Now, having, um, having, having been to uh, the Academy of Urbanism um, co Congress uh, in Birmingham last week I'm very, and various other events, I'm very conscious of how often design, building design, what I call prod the product, is at centre stage. And I want to, um, I suppose, put a geographer's perspective on this, because uh, that, that's the discipline I come from a long time ago. So what I'm saying is, this is urbanism. Um, I found this quite recently. It's, it's an aerial view of Michigan University campus. The interesting thing about it is they didn't put any paths in until people had been using the campus. And what they did was simply create a path where people were walking. And this is what people do when they're allowed to go from where they are to where they want to be. I suppose they, uh, these paths uh, represent desire lines. Now this, uh, to my mind, is an ancient way that human beings organize themselves. And it's what I uh, talk about when I talk about streets, I guess, as opposed to roads. Streets get us desire lines, paths get us from where we are to where we want to be. And over time, those desire lines and pathways, sometimes originally made by animals, um, become urbanism. They become our cities. And this is ancient. Uh, the oldest roads or the oldest streets are 5,000 years old. And they persist. Uh, this is a picture of Watling Street uh, in the city of London, leading up to Paul, St. Paul's Cathedral there, a couple of thousand years old. And the other one I particularly like is the Via Domitia in Narbonne. Uh, it's a Roman road uh, which uh, the archaeologists in Narbonne, southwest France, have excavated. So it's about three metres below current street level. But you can see, you can actually walk on the cobbles uh, that the Roman centurions walked on. But what I love about this picture is you can see it is still a street, albeit a few metres higher. It is the street that continues down between those buildings. That has been used as a routeway for a couple of thousand years. And um, Hopefully, uh, so long as nothing happens to Narbonne, it will continue to be used as such. So streets are very old ways of organising ourselves. They are, they are part of the human condition. And I think increasingly, in the, uh, as the centuries roll by, we will look back on the late 21st century as quite an aberration in the way we've been organising ourselves. By that I mean, uh, here's uh, an example of uh, the cafes of Paris, which Le Corbusier called the fungus that eats up the pavements. And there's his plan for central Paris, which um, some may regret not having been built, but I can say from 
uh, a valuation point of view, would have mightily devalued that great city. Um, a real anti-streets sort of move. So we have this sort of ideological way of doing things that came about in the late 20th century. It wasn't just about the automobile. The automobile city coincided with this sort of uh, thinking, this anti-street thinking. So when we talk about urbanism, we're actually talking about trying to get back to that sort of original uh, desire line uh, type uh, organization of space. We're also talking about the content of that space. Now, this is a slide I keep using um, because I just think it exemplifies what we mean by the content of real sustainable urbanism. It's the uh, short walk to the pint of milk and the, uh, uh, or the pint of beer. But what it is, uh, all the lists here, and they're deliberately sort of so that you can't read them, but it's a long list of lots and lots of different types of land use. And what it is, is simply a page from a, a, a client document we must have done maybe 15 years ago. Uh, but it's absolutely typical of what we keep finding when we look at really good, already successful places, pieces of urbanism of different sizes, different types, different locations, different socioeconomic groups. What you find is there's a lot of stuff going on in good urbanism. And it's not just housing. And there's a huge danger, I think, in the current sort of discussion, the current conversation about supplying housing. So we're forgetting that people have to live, have to exist in a place. And what we've found is that, by and large, if you land a household in a location, that household will in and of itself give rise to demand for one job. If you think of all the goods and services you consume, the estate agents down the road that you might use once in a while if you have to, or the jobbing solicitor, or the, um, uh, the financial advisor, the bank, the building society, the corner shop, all the things that you do in your existence, you create a job. Or your, you and your family create a job for one person, roughly. And these things include things like um, things we never talk about when we're talking about building new places. Uh, funeral parlours, for example. Um, we do, unfortunately, all need them, uh, but they're very rarely put into any kind of neighbourhood plan or built plan. Um, what else have we got here? Just uh, nightclubs, pubs, restaurants, laboratories, libraries, kitchens, catering uh, places. You know, there's some things that are obvious, some things that are not, not, not obvious. But there's a lot of stuff in good places. So that's something. Uh, so mixed use is definitely uh, about sustainable urbanism. And... Um, we can't go very far without uh, coming to some of our, the work. We've repeated a whole series of studies over the years about open spaces, about certain types of streetscape, about um, all sorts of different aspects of sustainable urbanism. And it culminated um, about a, a, nearly a decade ago now in our research uh, with the Princess Foundation, the HBF, and various others. Uh, actually looking at the value of this in, in absolutely commercial terms. So what we did was we found three pieces of modern sustainable urbanism. Now the first lesson probably of the exercise was just how very difficult it was to find pieces of good modern urbanism. But what we did, uh, we compared Fairford Lees, uh, good old Poundbury I'm afraid, and uh, Crown Street in Glasgow. So I'm, it's great that you've mentioned... Uh, uh, Glasgow, because uh, Crown Street is a, a piece of urbanism, new urbanism, a, a piece of re, uh, urban regeneration in the middle of the Gorbals, in actual fact. So what we were trying to do was get a variety of different types um, of, of, of urbanism across different uh, locations. And what we did, we compared them on a direct, like-for-like -like basis with other new developments in exactly the same sort of location, and with what we called old urbanism, which was a bit of the old town or city that they were built in. And what we did, we, we added up the value of all the buildings uh, and expressed it on a per hectare basis. So land is a common denominator. It, it, that created a like-for-like -like comparison. 
Now, we had expected to find that good urbanism would kind of hold its own, that it wouldn't be worth less than other types of urbanism. But what we found, overwhelmingly, in some cases it was 45% more valuable than the comparator, the modern comparator. And the question, and it has been ever since, every time we do these sorts of value comparisons, we've just completed one uh, which isn't published yet on London uh, local authority and ex-local authority housing estates and the, uh, their regeneration potential. We keep finding good urbanism is worth way, way more and probably costs less to build and is less expensive to, keep, uh, to maintain over time um, than what we're currently building. So the question shifts not from is it more valuable but to why the hell don't we do it more often? I want to just, before anybody gets activated by the word valuable, I just want to, as it were, justify that. We, we measure primarily residential property values. And what we've found is they're a very, very good proxy, not just for economic value, but also for social and, and environmental value, simply because grotty places don't grow in value and people don't want to be there, they're not desirable and therefore they're not valuable. So we find it's a very good proxy for a whole range of other social goods, if you like. It captures that quite well. And I suppose if we start to try and understand why it's valuable, well, it's because people seem to like these places more. And what this uh, survey showed, a survey of a very uh, large representative sample of a range of householders right across Britain in all types of tenure, we asked people what was most important to them about their home. Now, it could be important because it was there or because it was not there. But it w uh, we carried this out at a time when a lot of politicians were talking a lot about community. And for those of you with good eyesight, you'll see community is right down at the bottom end here. But right up at the top end is neighbourhood. Neighbourhood, neighbourhood, neighbourhood keeps coming up. There's something about a walkable local area that's incredibly important to people. And the external appearance, the uh, presence of amenities like good schools, a feeling of safety came way above actually any size considerations. So, you know, any developer who's trying to get the maximum uh, pounds per square foot or thinking about the maximum square footage on a site is actually missing a trick because what's more important, much more important to people, is actually the quality of the place they're going to be living in. So that's what helps to create value. And I decided at the last minute to put this in because I think it's, um, it speaks to um, another role uh, which is becoming much more important as we talk about delivering uh, more housing, uh, more building. It's an Ipsos Mori poll that was commissioned by Create Streets. And one of the questions it asked was, would you support in your own local area building, and they tried to keep it uh, uncontroversial and not bring in too many issues, on brownfield land. So they didn't introduce the whole green field or green, green belt sort of argument, but said, would you be in support of it? Now, interestingly, the majority of people were either moderately uh, tending to support or strongly supporting it. So they're shown in green there, just over half. And then those uh, two groups, the people who opposed uh, development and those who um, supported it, were asked to look at five pictures of different types of development. Now, they weren't told where they were, but they were asked, um, as the question says, would you support them in, 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 your, in your area? Now, what I find really, really interesting here is several things. There are two types of housing that that got clear support, 75% uh, like type C and 73% like type A, and would support it in their area. Now, notice, one is, as it were, historic pastiche, for those of you who look at the architecture, but the other one isn't. It's, 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 it's modern. It, but what they both do is have a, a very defined se a sense of street frontage. They're, they're clearly on the streets. And uh, the one at Bude also uh, got uh, some support. Again, a street-based, though not quite addressing the street in the same way. The least popular um, either were on streets but didn't, as it were, address the street, 
or were not on the street. So that's how people who are generally in support of, um, of development anyway responded to these particular pictures. And I think they're quite uncomfortable for some of the people. This, this, these results are quite uncomfortable for some people in the, in the built environment pr profession, not least because the two least popular won the most architectural awards. The others haven't. <laughs> But commercially, they're really, really important because look what happens. For those, um, those who support, it, 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 the level of support is even higher. But those who generally oppose even brownfield development in their area can be swayed. Half of them can be swayed by this type of development and turn into supporters. So though they said in principle they were against development, when they see this sort of thing, they turn and, and beca become supporters. Now that's hugely commercially valuable. And, um, and is part, I think, of the urbanist... Um, potentially part of the urbanist's toolkit to start changing things. Now, broadening it out from that to the more global sort of view, this happens to be Green Park in Reading, but it's typical of out-of-town, purpose-built, single-use, low-density, low-intensity business park. And increasingly, globally, we're finding this is defunct. There is a real problem with value. So much so that the third phase of Green Park will not go ahead as originally conceived and there's all sorts of plans to try and change it and make it more mixed and residential and so forth. But this sort of thing, this very, very car-reliant, single-use sort of thing just isn't working. And it isn't working globally. The, uh, the, the same issues apply in the USA. We got very interested in this um, part, partly because uh, we could see that the likes of Google, for example, were really struggling to retain talent in Silicon Valley because everyone wants to, to, to be in San Francisco. Suddenly, the lure of this sort of out-of-town place or non-place non is really losing out, and I'll talk about a bit more about that later. So what's out? Well, what's out is Green Park, and what's in is Box Park. And this is, um, no, this is Shoreditch, but uh, it's happening everywhere. Uh, this is not just London, it's, it's all over the place. And as a result of this, uh, what, what we were observing, we decided to do uh, a, a more in-depth look at what the new digital economy <coughs> was doing in terms of uh, cities. And we, we took a look at what we could, and we started a year-long program, uh, which we called our Tech Cities Program. And we went and measured a whole range of things uh, in places where we found tech was really working and the tech economy is growing. Uh, I think in the UK, over the last five years, the finance sector of the economy has actually shrunk. But science and tech has grown, and it's grown, I think, by about 13% or something like that. It's, it's a strong growth uh, and the highest growth uh, sector. So it's an important sector, and I think we're just seeing, we're just on the foothills of the Himalayas of the digital age, um, very exciting. But it's making a difference in the urban sphere. So these are our top cities, our top tech cities. And we measured a r whole range of things that they offered, r ranging from the presence of financial capital right through to the attractiveness of, of their environment to uh, in attracting uh, talented workers, for example, and a whole host of things in between. So we looked at quality of life. We did look at the cost of uh, accommodation, although we found that was not, uh, a d um, if you like, a, a, a highly distinguishing uh, factor in tech cities. You'll see the one that tops our rank is a place that I certainly certainly wasn't on my radar until maybe five years ago, and that's Austin in Texas. <coughs> Austin in Texas is teeny, teeny, tiny compared with those other, some of those other mega world cities there. But what it does have in spades is a sense of place. 
uh, if you want to talk about placemaking. Uh, I've only discovered recently, oh, bloody hell, I've got five minutes, and how hell am I going to right. Uh, the point about this is small places like Austin, like Dublin, like Tel Aviv and Berlin are out competing and punching way, way above their weight and taking on Hong Kong, Singapore, London and New York in terms of being tech cities. There's real potential because these places are attracting the human capital. In a world where it's no longer about uh, physical capital, you don't have to be close to the uh, iron ore or the coal, and it's not even so much about the financial capital. It's all about attracting talent. The places that attract the talent are the ones that are performing economically in the digital age. And I joke, this is our most important index that we've uh, come up with. It's the flat white index for any self-respecting hipster in Shoreditch or Williamsburg, New York, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, this this is, is what really matters. But it does capture the environment, the sort of environment where you're going to bump into ideas and talent and people and um, create that intellectual capital that's so important in the digital age. Um, I'll skip over this one. Um, the point is that uh, some world cities have much more of that than others. So I come back to the question, why are we building this? I apologise to anyone who might be involved in this particular bit of Acton. But it was sent to me by a friend recently, and I just thought uh, one could tear, tear one's hands out, hair out because you can see some old streetscape that, if extended into this area, would ju just work superbly well. You'd fit more in. You'd get something that's more popular with people. There's a huge opportunity here, and we're still in one of the world's biggest sort of capital cities with um, HS1, uh, it's not HS1, um, the uh, Crossrail right on the doorstep, and we're still producing pavilions in parks. It looks more like that plan that, of Le Corbusier's in Paris. We're still turning our backs completely on streets. We're still turning our backs on 5,000 years of human organization. And the question has to be why? So, I'm going to try in the last three minutes to explain why and put forward some of the things that we ought to be talking about. It's all about the timing. The time scale over which the value of good places, sustainable urbanism accrues, is beyond <coughs> the average developer's horizon. And what this tries to show is what you've got in the background are house prices rising and rising. And that's what most developers take. That's what they buy into. They buy the land low, they sell it high, or, um, and it's, it, 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 it's actually taking a chunk of that. Our state case studies show in pink up there that Yes, sustainable urbanism, good design and all the rest of it can add value and does add value over time. But the biggest increase occurs way after the first land is sold. Or if it is expected, the landowner takes the value. So what we do is take all the value out of the placemaking and load it either into land value or into the early adopters who, stay, who buy in uh, at the first and uh, and and stay with stay with it, but it doesn't go to the speculative private sector developer who has to make an annual return on capital employed. It's too short a time scale, and private house builders are fundamentally the wrong sort of entity to be able to do anything about this. So though we demonstrate again and again there's value there, it cannot be realised, and that's really really key. So, in the 20 seconds or so I have left, I want to put forward a theory. My theory is that we are totally, totally focused on only one of the three corners, the eternal triangle of development, if you like. And that is what I would call product. So, again and again, whenever you're talking urbanism, you will see lots of fantastic pictures and diagrams and maps. And I, I, Don't get me wrong, I think it's fascinating. I'm absolutely fascinated by it. But... Without paying attention to the land and the money, the other two rather boring sort of corners of it, you don't get anywhere with the product. And I want to try and sort of illustrate that. 
you know, if, if, if you just get, um, for example, uh, the land and the product, you get vanity pro uh, projects, you know, the landowner just do, do it, doing their own thing. If you only uh, are focused on the money and the uh, product, then the product serves the money, you get the homogenous housing estates that we're also used to. It's only when they all come together that you get to that sweet spot in the middle. And I want to try and characterize that sweet spot because I think without actually really thinking about it and how it all works together, we're never going to get anywhere, whether we're talking about garden cities, new towns, new settlements, eco-villages, eco-towns, whatever the latest thing is. If we're talking about high-quality places that really work for people and have long-term value, you have to ha have an understanding of the real barriers to that. You have to have a political will to overcome those barriers. So it means the industry actually talking some sense to politics and, uh, and the politicians being able and long-term enough to listen. So in my view, it has to be a cross-party sort of solution. You have to think a lot about how vehicles and business models work or don't work for long-term urbanism. And, and straight away, they have to be, in my view, a lot longer term. There's quite a bit of successful urbanism, both in Asia and, and the USA, where private property developing companies actually not only build and develop, but ongoingly own. Uh, there's one that I think developed a lot of Denver Airport, which has delivered incredibly quickly, a lot of housing. It's uh, been going for 80 years. They still have land holdings of things they, they developed and built 80 years ago. It's that sort of you know, Grosvenor estate in modern form. I think some of the housing associations are superbly well placed to become some of these long-term landowners. Local authorities, public landowners could endow themselves with long-term incomes out of this. There's a lot of potential in it. And one of the things about concentrating, first of all, on those desire lines to create the streets is that if you break up a site that you want to develop as a, as a new settlement of any kind to small plots, you can actually get very many more diverse routes to market than just relying on the owner-occupier buying from a speculative house builder. You can get self-build. There's, there's, a, there's a whole another sub subject for another day. But most countries, uh, developed countries, build far, far more, uh, self-procure a lot more. Uh, it's not all about grand designs. Uh, you get um, investors building purpose-built letting properties. You get uh, sub-market renting. You get uh, intermediate uh, renting, intermediate ownership, and various other diverse products, diverse types of use, tenures, and so forth, are being delivered, because it can be delivered by lots of different players on uh, smaller plots of land. Uh, the product needs to be flexible. We don't know, we haven't got a clue really what's going to happen to the economy in 10 years' time, let alone 50 years' time. We do know that the digital age will disrupt a huge number of things. But whatever's built has to be as flexible as Georgian townhouses that have been just about everything under the sun. Um, I think there has to be a long-term ownership and stewardship and management of land and place. And we have to focus much more on income streams. And by income streams, I mean capital receipts as well as just rents. So we, we mustn't get too hung up on the private rented sector solving everything either. The, these issues are not going to be solved by a single bullet. You know, it's going to have to be a scattergun a, a approach. And inherently, such a vehicle has to be sustainable, but is sustainable. Because if you're focused on the value of the places that people live and literally invest their lives in, you're actually going to create monetary value as well as social and environmental value. So those three corners of sustainability get taken care of. So please, when you're sketching, designing, drawing, whatever it is you do, don't forget land and money. Thanks very much.